We're passionate that what the world needs is global democracy. But we've heard many people are disillusioned with democracy and think it doesn't work. While other people very much support the importance of democracy at the national level, but think it's impossible at the global level. In this talk, I'm going to have a look at the history of democracy and the possible future of democracy and try to answer both these points. So, if we look at the political systems of most European countries at the start of the 19th century, we see that they had a system of decision-making where the wealthy, land-owning elite got to make decisions for the whole of society. A kind of democracy of the elite, if you will. There were governments and parliaments, but on average only 2% of the adult male population had a vote. Eligibility to have a vote was based on how much land, or how much wealth, one had. So the landed gentry, the small minority of 2% who lived in great opulence and in large mansions, they got to vote, while the vast majority of people, the serfs, the workers, the farmers, the 98%, those who were living in shocking poverty, they had absolutely no vote and no say in how their society was governed. And so it's not surprising that the elite decision makers made decisions and policies which benefited the elite and which were not good at all for the masses. And thus the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and rates of inequality soared. Things only began to change with the Industrial Revolution. First of all, serfs and farmers started to move away from the countryside to become factory workers in the towns. Here conditions were often even worse, and people began to agitate for improvements. And in the towns they met other people from different areas, they began to develop a national identity rather than a purely local one based on their village. They began to think of their society on a larger scale, not just of the feudal manor. And they began to want to have a say in how the society was run. Secondly, the new industrial entrepreneurs who were running the factories and making lots of money were often not from the landed gentry. And thus, even though they began to become very wealthy, most of them were not eligible to vote because they didn't own land. And they too wanted a say in the running of society. But why should the landed elite listen to either of these two groups? They had all the power and had absolutely nothing to gain by sharing it with anyone else. And thus throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century, there were strikes and protests and demonstrations and even violent revolutions in virtually every European country. The primary call was for democracy, for the right to vote. This was seen as the key to improving all of the other problems in society. And over the course of the next 100 to 150 years, government after government lowered the threshold of how much land you had to own or how much money you had to have in order to be eligible to vote. This carried on step by step by step until by the end of the 19th century, the vast majority of European countries now let all males over the age of 18 vote. A subsequent struggle, of course, continued by the women, as they too demanded the right to vote. The suffragettes tied themselves to railings, ran in front of racehorses, blew up post boxes, and used all sorts of techniques to get their voice heard. And eventually they too were successful. And by the middle of the 20th century, the impossible had happened. The elite had given the vote to everyone, and there was universal suffrage in virtually every European country. The struggle had been long, but it was successful. The disenfranchised 98% now got their right to vote. And indeed, in the years after the Second World War, most of them voted for Labour governments, with leaders from the trade unions who represented the workers, and who put in policies that led to the creation of much more just and equal societies. They institutionalised the welfare state, which provided free education and health care to everyone, which improved public infrastructure and public services, and which stepped up welfare services to the unemployed and disabled. And as an indicator of how much better society got now that there was democracy, let's look at this graph of income inequality during the 20th century produced by French economist Thomas Piketty. The graph starts on the left-hand side in 1910, and we can see that there is a very high degree of inequality. But as we go forward in time, 
the degree of inequality goes down as the degree of democracy increases. And in most of the lines, there's a quite dramatic decrease in inequality in the late 1940s, after the Second World War. So we can see that during the middle part of the 20th century, up until around 1980, there's a really quite low degree of economic inequality during this period that democracy prevails. But then things start to change, and we see a sharp increase in inequality going up to 2010, where the graph ends, but indeed this increase continues until today. Before we consider why that is, let's just reflect on what happened in the 19th century. Workers and farmers managed to unite together in a common protest against the elite. This may sound simple, but at the beginning of this period, these people were very diverse and separate and knew little about each other and had no sense of themselves as a common group, as workers or the proletariat or what have you. A coal miner from the north of England, say, did not feel any sense of unity with a machine worker from the west of England, and neither of them would have considered they had anything in common with a seamstress from anywhere in England. But during the course of the 19th century, these disparate groups came together, learnt about each other, and began to see that despite their differences, they were indeed positioned in a similar way in the national economic system. Their differences of trade, of gender, of location, or whatever else, became largely irrelevant in their common struggle. And by recognising their unity and coming together in joint political action, they succeeded in bringing about what many people would have said was impossible. If you were a serf living at the beginning of the 19th century, working the lands of your feudal master while he enjoyed a life of luxury and opulence and got to vote in a parliament which kept things as they were, and some visionary came up and told you that in the future everybody would be able to vote and that there would be a democratically elected government that would make a more just and fair society, that would lower rates of inequality and would provide free education and free healthcare to everyone. Well, you would have probably laughed and called that person a naive idealist. The elites won't give up their power, you'd say. It's not possible. It's just a fantasy. And indeed, that sounds quite reasonable. But if everyone had thought like that, nothing would have changed. But instead, a few brave souls started to imagine a better society and started to share this vision with others. And as the vision inspired people, they began to get active. Leaders emerged to help organize them. They used the new technologies of the day. They were creative. They were determined. And eventually, they were successful. The situation is in many ways rather similar to the situation today regarding global democracy. To many people, global democracy seems like a great idea, but a kind of idealist and impossible fantasy. The global masses are too diverse and separated, you say. What does a factory worker in Bangladesh have in common with an agricultural worker in Kenya? Or with indigenous peoples in Latin America? How could they possibly all come together in a common struggle? Well, it's already starting to happen. And in any case, you argue, how could we create a unified global society when we're all just too diverse? Well, history is the story of diverse people recognizing their unity and coming together. In the age of the internet and mobile technology, surely we can do it too. Oh, but the elites will never give up their power, you say. Well, they won't voluntarily. But they have given it up before, and there's no reason why they won't do it again. It's up to us to create the right conditions so that they choose to do so. Right now, the path to success is not clear or obvious, but neither was it at the beginning of the 19th century. It's up to us to start and work it out as we go along, just as they did. So this is what the history of democracy tells us about the possibility of democracy at the global level. It is possible, if we want it and if we are prepared to struggle for it. But what about the other question that I mentioned at the beginning? Is democracy any good? Many think it doesn't seem to be working very well now, even at the national level. Do we actually want global democracy? So let's go back to the graph of economic inequality. Why were things so good between, say, 1950 and 1980? And why did things start to get worse after that? There's been democracy throughout all this period, right? So why did it stop working? Well, the question of whether there has been democracy through all this period is actually a bit complicated. 
The answer is kind of yes and no. You see, in the period between roughly 1950 and the early 1980s, each country had its own economy, and the economies of different countries were only slightly interconnected. There was trade between countries, of course, but at quite low levels. Most businesses operated in just one country, and they were regulated by the government of that country. So essentially, in this period, the government and the economy overlapped. They were at the same scale, and thus the democratically elected government could regulate the economy so that it functioned for the benefit of everyone. So this was the time of real democracy and of relative equality within states. Now, while this situation was very good for most people, it wasn't so great for the elite. They had to pay taxes and follow regulations, and they found that this began to limit the amount of profit that they could make. In 1975, a group of elites from Europe, America and Japan, called the Trilateral Commission, wrote a report called The Crisis of Democracy. The crisis, they argued, was that there was too much democracy, or in their words, an excess of democracy. Citizens were beginning to participate too actively and were demanding too many government services, and this was making it all rather difficult to do business profitably. The solution, they argued, was therefore to limit democracy. The report didn't specify exactly how democracy should be limited, but the elites could draw on some ideas from the work of British-Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek. Hayek had written quite explicitly that democracy needed to be limited in order for the economy to function optimally, or as we might say, so that the elites could make big profits. He argued that while a certain amount of democracy was a good thing for society, most economic matters should be carefully bracketed out of democratic control. He contended in particular that governments should not have the right to raise taxes for the purpose of redistribution, and he argued strongly against any notion of social justice. Hayek and other neoliberal economists figured out several clever ways to bring economic matters out of democratic control, while still leaving the structures of democracy in place. The most fundamental way was to expand the economy beyond the borders of the state. In a globalised economy, no state would be able to control and regulate the economy, and thus the economy would effectively escape democratic control. And indeed, since around the beginning of the 1980s, Western governments have implemented policies to enable economic globalisation. They've removed capital controls and tariffs and duties and made it easier and easier for capital to flow across borders and for national economies to integrate into one big global economy. This is what we generally call globalization, or more precisely, neoliberal globalization. And at the same time as the economy is globalized, government and regulation has remained at the state level. And thus much of the economy has now indeed escaped democratic control. Governments now find it very hard to tax elites or big corporations, for example, because they can simply move their money outside of the country, ideally to a tax haven, where it can sit in secret. This has greatly helped the elites to make big profits. And there are a whole load of other ways that parts of the economy have been quietly removed from democratic control. Central banks have been given independence to make monetary policy, in many cases outside of democratic government control. And in many countries around the world, the World Bank and the IMF have encouraged governments to draft new constitutions which insulate certain key economic and financial matters away from parliamentary control. And a whole raft of undemocratic global governance arrangements have been created, not by coincidence mainly in the economic and financial spheres, which govern key areas of the global economy without any input from democratically elected parliamentarians, and without the majority of the world's peoples even knowing anything about them. Put all these things together, and you'll see that there has been a process of economic de-democratization taking place since the 1980s. The structures of democracy still exist, political parties, elections, and so on, but it's been hollowed out. Economic matters, in particular, have been largely removed. And this explains two things. Firstly, it explains why that graph of economic inequality starts changing direction around 1980, and why inequality starts rising after that. The economy was taken largely out of democratic control. Most of the regulatory tools that governments can use to limit inequality, 
such as taxation and redistribution, became ineffective or much, much less effective than they had been in the previous years. And this also explains the sense that many people have these days that democracy is somehow not working. That's because in certain key areas, it's not. But that doesn't mean that democracy as a system of governance is no good. On the contrary, it shows that neoliberal economic globalization has undermined national democracy. If we have a global economy, but national level democracy, then the national level democracy will not be able to function properly, at least in respect to economic matters. So what to do? If we want democracy, proper democracy, then we have to organize things so that democratic government and the economy are on the same scale. Only in that way can the economy come under democratic control. So there are two options. Either we reduce the scale of the economy back to the national level, or we expand the scale of democratic government up to the global level. In other words, we can choose between deglobalization or global democracy. In our high-tech world of ever-increasing internet connectivity, I don't think that retracting back into our small nation states is a serious option. The world is interconnected. People are interconnected. The ecology is interconnected. The climate is interconnected. What we need now is political interconnection, a way in which the voice of the people can be heard, a way in which the many can govern the world and its resources for the benefit of everyone a way in which we can come together to solve global problems. If we want to do all this and save our national democracies, then we need global democracy. It's the best option, and I believe it is possible. This is the future of democracy. Mm -hmm.